Here at China's National Silk Museum are displays of silk clothing dating back thousands of years. The fact that the textile industry was so developed meant prices were kept at a reasonable level. During the Han Dynasty around 2,000 years ago, a bolt of silk was sold in Chang'an for about 400 bronze coins, somewhat less than 50 grams of silver. This was almost 100 times cheaper than in Rome, so why was the price difference so huge? The answer can be found on this interesting wall inside the Tang West Market Museum. Instead of traveling the length of the Silk Road from beginning to end, the silk was transported in relays and it was sold and resold multiple times. Along the 10,000 mile road, foreign middlemen made their fortunes. At each stage of the journey, the price of the silk became higher, increasing from 50 grams per bolt to an amount more expensive than gold. And then when it finally arrived in Rome, there were multiple tariffs to be paid. However, the fortunes made from the sale of silk on the route also benefited local populations who lived along it. For the Romans, however, the obsession with silk came at a huge price. According to the Roman scholar Pliny, the Roman Empire paid no less than five tons of gold per year for silk and various other goods imported from China and other nations in the East. In an attempt to control the situation, the Roman Senate launched various bans on the wearing of silk clothes, but these measures failed miserably. In the end, Rome decided on two courses of action, gaining more control over the prices being charged and guaranteeing a stable supply. The delicacy and beauty of silk has made it highly sought after in the West since it was first introduced. This is, after all, why the trade route between Chang'an and Rome came to be called the Silk Road. Thirteen hundred years ago, he was one of the most well-known figures in the Chinese city of Chang'an. This solitary Buddhist monk embarked on a non-stop pilgrimage traveling west on the Silk Road towards India in search of Buddhist scriptures. His name was Tang Sung, also known as Xuanzang. His adventures were later told by Wu Chang'an in the classic epic novel Journey to the West. But what actually happened during the journey is recorded in the book Xuanzang wrote himself. In the Library of Northwest University of Political Science and Law, one can read Buddhist records of the Western world, which was written by Xuanzang, the famous traveling monk. In the book, he tells of arriving at a place called Kustana. There, he was surprised to discover that Chinese silkworms were being cultivated far to the west of their native land. Xuanzang the place recorded in the book as Kustana was located in today's Xinjiang province. Back then, though, it was a nation of mystery to the far west of Chinese civilization. The story was confirmed in 1900 when the famous British explorer Mark Aurel Stein uncovered a precious relic during an archaeological dig. The artifact is an engraved piece of wood, and it offers compelling evidence that the silkworms in the west did indeed come from China. The engraving depicts an elegant princess with a crown on her head. To her left is a maid who points to her mistress's crown, implying that within it there is a secret. Beside her is a basket full of silkworms and two people busy weaving. Viewed as a whole, the engraving appears to depict an episode in history that had long been hidden. This is consistent with the account recorded by the monk Xuanzang. 
In his book, Before Making Her Journey to Kostana for a Marriage Arranged for Reasons of Diplomacy, the Princess of the East hid silkworms in her crown, and as a result, silkworms and silk-producing methods spread across the Western regions. Buddhist records of the Western world presents us with a significant story that reveals how the Silk Road created business opportunities, made possible cultural and technological exchanges, and greatly enhanced the ability of nations to learn from each other. Yet it took Rome hundreds of years longer to develop its own silk-making industry. Why was this? These silk fragments date back to the Tang Dynasty over a thousand years ago. Even though silk-making methods had been exported to other countries, along the Silk Road, it was silk from China that was still the most sought after. This sophisticated industrial chain left the Tang Dynasty uniquely placed in the international silk trade. The Persian Empire, conveniently located between Chang'an and Rome, built up a highly lucrative business as the middleman between the East and West. To maintain its strong position, Persia withheld silk-making methods from the West and spared no effort to block direct trade between China and Rome. Over time, this was to trigger a number of wars between the Roman and Persian empires. In the 6th century AD, Rome finally overcame the obstacles put in place by the Persian Empire and the city was finally able to get hold of silkworm eggs brought to them from China by Indian monks. This made it possible for Romans to produce silk themselves. After the Industrial Revolution in the late 18th century, Italy became the hub for Europe's silk industry, and it eventually became the leading nation in the art of silk making. This fashion show in Xi'an brings the legacy of the Silk Road directly into the modern world. These creations are the product of groundbreaking collaborations and connections between East and West. Despite the wars, hardships, and long and challenging journeys, in the end it all paid off. As Xunzi said in his poem on the silkworm, after painful yet amazing transformations, silkworms will benefit the whole world. Chinese people often refer to goods as Dongxi, which translated literally means East and West. But why not Nanbei, meaning south and north? The answer lies in the ancient city of Chang'an. Back in the Tang Dynasty a thousand years ago, the city had two large markets, one in the east, the other in the west. Over time, people began to refer to all goods as Dongxi, meaning goods from either market. On South Labour Road in today's Xi'an, we can still see the original site of the West Market established in the Tang Dynasty over a thousand years ago. At the time, it was the world's biggest international trade center. Today, it's regarded as the starting point of the Silk Road. This is Many artifacts were retrieved from this archaeological site, including scales, abacus beads, and coins from various countries. This illustrates the large volume of trade at the time. That's why the West Market earned its name, Gold Market. This model shows how the gold market might have looked. Exactly how big was the world's largest market? According to records, the West Market covered an area of approximately 107 hectares. That's as large as the combined size of over 130 football fields. It was home to more than 40,000 shops, not to mention thousands of street stalls. Walking around, you would have been surrounded by hundreds of traders. The market was said to offer over 200 different types of business, from silk and jewelry to books and medicine. Goods as big as a horse or as small as a bag of spices were available. 
There were wine shops and tea houses frequented by educated literati. And it was said there was good money to be made out of even selling porridge. Such was the prosperity of this busy market. The entrance for foreign traders was Kaiyuan Gate, and since the West Market was closer to this gate than the East Market was, there were more business opportunities to be had at the West Market and more imported goods. It was a flourishing international market. Was there an equivalent to the West Market on the opposite side of the world in Rome? The city of Rome was built along the Tiber River, which flowed 50 miles south to the Mediterranean Sea. The mouth of the river was a crucial gateway for imports and exports, and it was the final stop on the Silk Road. In Ostia, an ancient city built for military defence and trading, one can see the original site of the city's old seaside market. The market sat in a prime location just opposite the city's theatre. Hundreds of shops would have been clustered together here, arranged around a central square. Although today we can only see vague outlines, computer-generated images give us the chance to see how it might have looked in its heyday. In front of the stores are mosaics full of vibrant pictures and patterns. These mosaics feature the merchant's goods, so to some extent they are ancient advertisements. Wandering around this place with its ruins and crumbling walls, one can easily sense the history lurking right here under your feet. Even though the wealth of ancient times can no longer be seen, it's not difficult to feel just how prosperous it was in the ancient past. But has the curtain fallen on the trade and business that once flourished so freely here? On the modern streets of these two ancient cities, things are still very busy. Vendors are still hawking and people are still browsing. This is trade in the 21st century. Things change, people change. But one thing that goes beyond time and place is our never-ending desire to buy and sell.